everyone. Today, let's take a look at the configuration of eVPN L3 VPN V6 over SRV6BE. SRV6 supports two forwarding modes, SRV6T policy and SRV6BE, where BE stands for best effort. Although SRV6BE does not support traffic engineering, it does feature a simple configuration. You only need to configure SRV6BE on the ingress and egress of the network to complete surface deployment. As such, SRV6BE offers an advantage during the early stages of SRV6 deployment. From the perspective of the control plane, eVPN is a BGP-specific extension. L3 VPNv6 indicates that IPv6 is deployed between CEs, which access PEs through L3 VPN. Let's take a network with five devices as an example. P1, the P, and the P2 all belong to AS100 and reside on the public network. A bidirectional SRV6B path needs to be established between P1 and P2 to carry eVPN L3 VPNv6 services. In this example, C1 and C2 are both connected to PEs through IPv6. We can break down the configuration procedure into three main steps. The first step involves the configuration of ECs on P1, the P, and the P2 to achieve basic root reachability. The second step involves configuration of SRV6 on P1 and P2. Note that in SRV6 BE scenarios, SRV6 does not need to be configured on the P. Finally, the last step involves establishing a BGP EVPN peer relationship between P1 and P2, configuring CE access and using the eVPN peer relationship between P1 and P2 to advertise routes between C1 and C2. For ease of understanding, we'll obtain packet headers from this interface of P1 for in-depth packet parsing. Let's start by looking at how to configure ECS. ECS configuration consists of both global and interface-specific configuration. The configurations in this part are the same as those in the eVPN L3 VPN v4 scenario. After basic ECS configurations are completed on P1, the P, and the P2, ECS naval relationships can be established using ECS hello messages. Using this hello message as an example, let's take a closer look at the common ECS hello message format. The message carries multiple pieces of information, including the ease level, system ID, area address, supported protocol, neighbor MAC address, and interface address. In this example, the interface address is a link local address, which ECS can use to establish a neighbor relationship. Below the user configured global unicast address, we can see topology information which indicates the IPv6 independent topology that was previously enabled. The ID of an IPv6 topology is 2, while that of an IPv4 topology is 0. After the neighbor relationships are established, the devices exchange its LSPs to achieve LSDB synchronization. In LSDB maintenance, ECS may also use CSNPs and PSNPs to maintain LSDB integrity and synchronization. Moving on, let's switch our focus to the common ECS LSP format. ECS LSPs contain two types of key information, interface addresses and subnet information. After an LSDB is generated, ECS uses the SPF algorithm to calculate routes. The involved routing information consists of interface addresses and subnet route information. We can see that ECS routing information displayed in the command output of P1 is consistent with that carried in corresponding ECS LSPs. In addition, the next hope addresses are link local addresses, not user configured global unicast addresses. Next, we'll take a look at SRV6 configuration which primarily involves P1 and P2. We should enable SRV6 globally, configure a source address for SRV6 encapsulation, and then configure a locator, which is a prefix address used for locating in the SRV6 domain. As such, you are typically advised to ensure that each locator is unique in the SRV6 domain. 
Nevertheless, in some scenarios, such as multi-node protection, different devices may be configured with the same locator. After configuring SRV6, we need to enable ECs to advertise the SRV6 locator through the segment routing IPv6 locator command. This command can also enable ECs SRV6. When using this command, you can specify the auto seed disable parameter to disable ECs from dynamically generating end and end dot x seeds. This is because the two types of seeds are both path seeds, which are not used in SRV6 BE scenarios. The configurations on PE2 are similar to those on PE1. After the configurations are completed, ECs advertises SRV6 locator and seed information through LSPs. Let's look at an ECS LSP carrying SRV6 information. We can see that it differs significantly from the LSP sent before SRV6 is enabled. For example, it carries the router capability TLV, which contains information about SRV6 related capabilities. It also carries the SRV6 locator TLV, through which locator information is advertised. Similar to a common ECS LSP, this LSP also carries IPv6 interface addresses and network segment information. In this case, however, the network segment information contains locator information. In other words, due to special processing in SRV6, an ECS LSP can carry locator information in two places. The SRV6 locator TLV is primarily used to advertise locator routes to SRV6 capable devices. The TLV shown on the right is an original ECS TLV and can be identified by common IPv6 devices. As such, it can also be used to install locator routes. In this way, common IPv6 devices and SRV6 devices can be deployed together. If the two TLVs both exist in an ECS LSP, the TLV shown on the right is preferentially installed and used. In flex algo scenarios, because this TLV does not carry algorithm information, Huawei devices use the SRV6 locator TLV to install locator routes, which complies with relevant protocols. In addition, as dynamic seed generation by ECS has been disabled, is 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 incapable of generating end or end.x seeds. As such, neither type of seed is carried in the ECS LSP. After updating the LSDB, ECS uses the SPF algorithm to recalculate routes, which consists of subnet and locator routes. We can see that the first route is the locator route on P1, and the second route is the locator route on P2. According to the ECS routing table on the P, the P has also learned SRV6 routes through ECS LSPs. Consequently, the P can forward the received SRV6 packets through these routes. Next, let's turn our attention to BGP-related configurations. The first step involves creating a VPN instance on the corresponding PE, enabling the IPv6 address family, and configuring an RD and VPN targets. The RDs of two devices should be different. After configuring the VPN instance, we need to bind the specified interface to the instance, enable IPv6 on the interface, and configure an IPv6 address for the interface. Then we can allocate an n.dd6 seed to the VPN instance. To achieve this, we can either run the opcode command to configure an n.dd6 seed manually or use BGP to dynamically allocate such a seed in the future. The next step involves configuring routing information exchanges between P1 and C1. These exchanges can be implemented using multiple types of routing protocols, such as an IGP or a static routing protocol. We will use BGP for this example. Note that root IDs must be planned across the entire network before BGP configuration. Because the network involves only IPv6 addresses instead of IPv4 ones, the router ID is automatically generated by BGP may conflict, leading to a failure of BGP peer relationship establishment. For this reason, we need to plan router IDs before configuring BGP. 
Then we need to configure BGP on C1, which involves enabling the BGP peer relationship between C1 and P1. On C1, the configuration must be performed in the common IPv6 unicast address family view, and the local routes of C1 can be imported during the configuration. As for P1, the configuration must be performed in the IPv6 VPN instance address family view. After the preceding configurations are completed, an end.dd6 seed is generated on the PE and added to the local seed table, in which we can see that each local seed is bound to a VPN instance. An end.dd6 seed consists of two parts, locator and opcode. The former provides the locating function, while the latter represents a specific VPN instance. As such, the end.dd6 seed enables a device to not only direct data packets to the device advertising the seed, but also identify the corresponding VPN instance based on the opcode part. In contrast, two labels are required to achieve both of these functions in a conventional BGP MPLS VPN scenario. Next, we need to establish a BGP eVPN peer relationship between the PEs. This involves enabling the BGP peer relationship on each involved device and configuring loopback 1 as the connection interface. Note that the root reachability of this loopback interface has been enabled using ECS. Following that, we need to enable the specified peer in the L2 VPN eVPN address family. In this way, the BGP eVPN peer relationship is successfully established. After that, we need to perform SRV6 related configurations. For example, run the advertise L2 VPN eVPN command to enable the device to advertise the routes of the specified VPN instance as type 5 eVPN IP prefix routes to the peer through the BGP eVPN peer relationship. The next command is used to enable SRV6 for the IPv6 VPN instance address family and to add the seed attribute to the BGP eVPN routes to be sent. If no end.dd6 seed has been manually configured using the opcode command, a dynamically generated one can be used instead. Then we need to enable SRV6 BE based root recursion. Spur physically, enable SRV6 eVPN L3 VPN and configure the device to perform root recursion based on the seed attribute carried in eVPN roots. In this command, the keyword best effort indicates BE. Finally, run the peer advertise in cap type command in the L2 VPN eVPN address family view to enable the device to advertise eVPN roots carrying SRV6 encapsulation attributes to its peer. After the preceding configurations are complete, the devices exchange open messages to establish a BGP peer relationship and use keep alive messages to maintain it. Once the peer relationship is established, the devices exchange update messages carrying both path information and eVPN and LRI. Next, let's look at the format of a BGP update message. This message carries common path attributes, such as the origin, as path, mat, and local pref attributes. In this example, we can see that the message also carries the extended communities attribute containing the VPN target configured for the corresponding VPN instance. We can also see that the BGP prefix seed attribute carries an n.dd6 seed. Below that, there is the eVPN nlri attribute, which indicates that the primary address family is L2 VPN. The sub-address family is eVPN. The next hope of the root is the loopback interface address configured on PE2, and the root type is type 5 IP prefix. In addition, the attribute carries the RDE, which is the RDE of the VPN instance configured on PE2. Here, the highlighted part shows information about the root advertised from C2 to PE2. Based on the received BGP update messages, P1 generates a BGP eVPN routing table. The command output shows that the specified root is already contained in the BGP eVPN routing table of P1. According to root details, we can see that the root carries RDE, router target, that is VPN target. 
and dot dt succeed and the root type information. Because the preferred root in the BGP EVPN routing table enters the IPv6 routing table, we can see this root in the IPv6 routing table of P1. The root has successfully recursed, with the outbound interface and next hop being displayed as SRV6BE and the n.dt6 seed of the VPN instance configured on P2, respectively. In addition, the root flag is RD, where R indicates that the root is recursive and D indicates that the root entry has been delivered to the FIB. The preferred route on P1 is advertised to C1 through the BGP peer relationship. It enters the BGP routing table of C1, as shown in the command output. Then, the preferred BGP route on C1 enters the IPv6 routing table of C1, enabling us to see the route in the IPv6 routing table of C1. After we run the ping command on C1 to ping C2, the ping operation succeeds. This indicates that the configuration is successful. Now that we've introduced the control plane implementation of EVPN L3 VPN V6 over SRV6BE, let's look at how packets are forwarded. In this example, a ping operation is initiated from C1 to C2 to simulate packet encapsulation. The ping packet sent by C1 is an ICMP request packet. C1 performs common IPv6 encapsulation for the packet. After receiving the packet, P1 performs SRV6 encapsulation, encapsulating the post recursion next hope, which is actually the n.dd6 seed configured on P2. The information on the right shows a reply packet sent by C2. After receiving the packet, P2 performs SRV6B encapsulation, encapsulating only a service seed, which is an n.dd6 seed. We can see that SRV6BE does not involve any SRH. To conclude this course, let's summarize what we have learned. We began by talking about VPN root advertisement. After a root in the IPv6 routing table is imported to the BGP routing table, C1 advertises the root to the IPv6 routing table of the specified VPN instance on P1 through the BGP peer relationship. Then we need to run the advertise L2 VPN eVPN command on P1 to enable the VPN instance to advertise routes to eVPN. P1 advertises the type 5 IP prefix route to P2 through the eVPN peer relationship, so that the route enters the eVPN routing table of P2. The route in the eVPN routing table is imported to the IPv6 routing table of the corresponding VPN instance based on RT information. P2 then advertises the route to C2 through the eBGP peer relationship, so that the route enters the BGP4 plus routing table of C2. Finally, the preferred route in the BGP4 plus routing table of C2 enters the IPv6 routing table for forwarding. Next, let's review the VPN data forwarding process. Assume that C1 sends a common IPv6 packet to P1. Simple IPv6 encapsulation is performed for the packet, using the address of C1 as the source address and that of C2 as the destination. After receiving the packet from the interface bound to the specified VPN instance, P1 searches the IPv6 routing table of the VPN instance according to the destination address in the packet, finds the associated SRV6 VPN seed and next hope information, and then performs encapsulation. The encapsulated source address is the configured SRV6 source address, and the destination address is an SRV6 VPN seed, that is the n.dd6 seed configured for the VPN instance on P2. After receiving the packet, the P searches the routing table according to the destination address and forwards the packet to P2. P2 then searches the local seed table according to the outer destination address and finds a matching n.dd6 seed which is bound to the specified VPN instance. As instructed by the seed, P2 removes the IPv6 header, searches the IPv6 routing table of the VPN instance corresponding to the seed, and forwards the packets to C2 accordingly. That concludes this course on eVPN L3 VPN v6 over SRV6BE. Thank you for watching.